Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what I was what I was saying was <laughs> before I was interrupted. <laughs> That, I, that I've been an examiner here and I feel actually as nervous as any student heading into an interview because um, I hold this place in high regard um, I, and I feel, at the one, I feel at the one time at home here and I feel at the, one at the same time as far away from the AA as it is possible to be. Uh, I've always maintained that, that feeling about this place. So this is the first time I presented myself through my work, not my personality. Um, if we could start with slides, this would be easier. Could I have the first? The, the talk, this is, does this echo in everybody's? Here. Yeah. The talk is about two aspects of work which we've been working on, myself and my partner Sheila O'Donnell. Um, two aspects of our work over the last five years. And they're summarized um, to some extent in these two photographs. The one on the left is on the north side of the Liffey with the south sun coming through on an, av on an average everyday street market under a glass canopy beside the Iron Bridge, beside the Hapney Bridge. And the one on the right is the Rock of Cashel, which is, I suppose, uh, Ireland's answer, Ireland's retort to the Acropolis. Um, <laughs> they, they're chosen, uh, they're chosen, I suppose, uh, carefully or carelessly from a whole bank of these first two slides could have been anything but it had to be the city and the landscape and I'm going to talk about city life and buildings which house city life and the sense of working towards an idea of city culture and I'm going to talk about buildings which um, operate on the landscape between profile between the profile of their form on the contour of the ground. And those two aspects are the things we think about most, or at least they're the tools I'm using to structure this talk to show you four projects, um, two of which are in the city, uh, one of which is in the landscape, and one of which is in, is in the city but of the landscape. The first project I'm going to show is the first, um, is the last project which I, which I would have showed here some years ago when we had an exhibition, which was at that time on a different site and for a different use. But we've been working on the question of Irish film on, on the Centre for Irish Film um, since 1986. And in 1987 or 1988, our clients for the Irish film, who were educators and cultural people in film, in Ireland, eventually decided that they, the only way they'd ever get a building was by buying a building. And we spent a long time with them trying to find a building which would suit. In the end, we bought this building, which is an, an old Quaker meeting house in the middle of a block. Uh, at the time of the, uh, I shouldn't say at the time of the colonial uh, domination since it lasted 800 years, but during the, <laughs> during the, um, <laughs> during the period of, uh, during the period of, of the assertion of the established church, uh, non-established churches had to keep to the back streets and keep to the core. So you find Presbyterians and Quakers sharing an inner block in the side streets of, a, of the centre of Dublin. And um, the Quakers had a new role, had a different role in the famine than almost every other religious group because they, in the 1850s, they, they gave of their, they gave of their uh, beneficence without any price. And so in the, eight, um, in the 1860s, quaking grew considerably in popularity, uh, while other religions might have shrunk. And so the Quakers, had, who had been in the middle of this block, started to grow and develop a lot of little buildings, which were built on top of other buildings. And so when we came into this site, 
1987, there were nine different buildings built between 1690 and 1920 on this site, on the foundations of each other and on top of each other and over each other. And then we found that not, it wasn't a question of simply buying this building. We had to make a proposal to the Quakers' monthly meeting as to why it would be that, that the Irish Home Centre could be sold the building. Then we found out the Quakers don't vote. They decide by consensus. So it took three meetings for the consensus to emerge. And we were down in the, in the end to ourselves, representing the Irish Home Centre, and the Hirschfield Institute, representing the gay community in Dublin, as being the only two people who could persuade the Prick Quakers that the way to maintain the community and collective use of their premises was through film culture, a place of gathering, a place of celebration of public life. Now, this is a digression, the first of a few probably, but, but it was important to us that the place we're working was a place of public gathering and that the people who, if you like, entrusted us with the project were passing on to us not just a piece of property in their terms, but something to do with their own culture and something to do with continuity. So we had to work with the buildings. We had to introduce film into the buildings. We had to make it into a modern project. But we also had this different uh, unspoken brief. And we find that there's almost always an unspoken program that the architect is working to. The building can be represented in two ways. One is by the survey drawings that we made inch by inch, um, rat by rat, uh, of all of the existing buildings that were on the site. The, the large rectangular one, which is in this photograph, is the oldest and, in a sim although simplest in volume, is the most complex in its history. Its foundations date from 1690. It's built in pink brick from the uh, 1700s up to about first floor level. Then as the Quakers grew in influence, they raised the roof on their, on their meeting house twice. So we have four layers of building inside one single rectilinear volume. And uh, for instance, there was a balcony in it, which you can see the scars of in that photograph. And the balcony had been moved about three times during its history and was moved again by us because of the new requirements of cinema. We surveyed the building. We had to think about its particular uh, condition, which was at the center of a block and not easily accessible. We had to think about a way of making this long, dark passageway, which was the tunnel that connected the Quakers to the street. We had to think about a way of making that a new route for, for public um, access. We had to think about how to keep the existing buildings in their strength and in their integrity and in their idea of being a place of public gathering. We also had to think about how to bring in a more dynamic, a more continuous, a more cinematic uh, sequence into the space. So we worked in this way, I have to say, for some time. The work didn't go on for that long, but the project kept coming in and out of the drawer while we went through fundraising to get us to planning permission, then fundraising to get us to bylaw approval, then fundraising to get us to fire officer approval. <coughs> All of you, many of you will be familiar with these long processes of cultural projects. So as each time the project came out of the drawer, something else happened to it. We moved a building around, or we changed the design of a part of the building, or we moved a bit of it, or we got a different uh, motivation about some other aspect. Um, which was an interesting process. This is, the, this is what they call slow track architecture, I suppose. Um, and, then, and then there was a, it didn't take long for people within the Film Institute and the film client body to get frustrated. And some people went off and decided they'd open a cinema. And because we were the only architects they knew, they, they asked us if, if we would do it. And because the Irish Film Centre had been so long in the drawer, and because we, at this stage we thought it would never happen, we at least decided to um, make permanent the plan idea of the Irish Film Centre in the sign of the Lighthouse Cinema. So uh, at one point in 1988, I think, this looked as far as the project would ever get, this one neon sign. Neon, on the other hand, is quick. And when you switch it on, the project is finished. And uh, this was switched on 10 minutes before cinema opened. Um, we were interested by this because it's the tiniest job you can imagine of an old cinema being taken over and taking all the clutter out of the glass 
I'm making a new sign, but we inadvertently painted these two columns here red. The door is here. You go in under the line of the where it says cinema, like you come in on the glass floor in the film center. You buy your ticket and you move and you go up where he's coming down. But we hadn't anticipated the effect of neon on plate glass, especially on people who, who wear glasses. And it, it came to a crisis when Peter Greenway walked straight into the window. Um, like a well-conditioned architect, he saw the two red columns and just <laughs> kept going. <laughs> So we had to solve that problem <coughs> two years later. Two years later, the Irish Film Centre was still in the drawer, and um, he s the man said, we've got a problem with the clear glass. You know your idea about uniting the street with the foyer? It's, uh, it's, it's too, too convincing. And, uh, and he's, well, he's a very sophisticated man, the, the, um, the man who runs the cinema. And he asked, would we think about it? Because he didn't want these stickers on the window. Because he, he'd already been trained by us not to have stickers on the window. <laughs> so we thought we could at least make a seat, which would, which would have several functions. One is that as you came down the stairs from the cinema, it would point towards the door. The other is that as, you, as your partner bought a ticket at the ticket office, you could sit on it and wait there. And the other is that if you fell through the plate glass window, there'd be something to land on when you came in. <laughs> But working with the metal and working with the steel and the man who made the steel brought us into a, a whole business about working with sheet steel and with the craftsman, which then came back in when the film centre finally went on site. The plan of the film centre as it was eventually built is that there's a large cinema, Cinema One in the old Quaker meeting house, and in, in the irregular volume, which is over here, of the women of the Lady Quakers Meeting House, which is upstairs, there's a kind of a club cinema. And on the ground floor, distributed through the plan and in the available nooks and crannies are all of the functions that go with cinema, the restaurant, the bar, the bookshop, the video lending, the film production offices, the film training, an Irish film archive, every single thing that can be joined under the umbrella of an Irish film centre. And then we made some new additions stitching through those buildings. And the, these are summarized in this drawing, which is the glass floor which leads you from street to foyer. The sense of the foyer as a public square or, a, or a, a public space within the cluster of old buildings. The addition of a new projector box, which is to project into the two old rooms which were listed and had to be maintained. And so the projector box sits, sits outside like a silent container of film. And then the addition of a new building to form the next street edge of the Irish Film Archive. Um, the first of these spaces is the foyer. Uh, the, when you arrive down the glass floor from the street into, into the foyer, um, we thought it might have the feeling that the, that the new elevation, that the new fourth wall of the space would form a sweeping backdrop, not, not too precise in its in its beginning or in its end, but, but with the very strong quality of surface, of skin, of a, a sort of surface texture, which would work hopefully with, with the bricks and things that were put in. What mainly concerned us actually in the end was the floor rather than the walls. And that earlier model I showed was a model to try to explain the textures and materials that we're using in the floor. Almost all the floor materials are of the same texture, which is uh, honed or sandblasted limestone, sandblasted glass, raw steel, um, polished concrete, Portland stone, uh, all materials which to a blind person would feel the same but, but have a different and completely different uh, visual and alchemical or visual and characterful presence. They now make posters of the Irish, postcards of the Irish Film Centre which uh, it's nice having your building turning into a t-shirt or a postcard. Or um, but for us, it was a different process. In this lecture, uh, I will sometimes talk about construction uh, as well as materials. But I think mainly I'm trying to talk about character in the architecture. But you probably have to read that between the lines while I talk about the construction. <coughs> this, th this was what 
we did to the buildings um, to clear out the site. It had been built over and over and over, and we took out various layers in kind of clean, in clean and dirty uh, mechanisms. And so this window, for instance, is cut to the ground in this photograph to make, to make a new door into the bar. And the yellow wall is cutting right through here and connecting into the bar and connecting to the bookshop on the other side. Um, I show this to you because it's actually interesting to us how the building grows and changes through time. And remember that with the arts center budgets that we're working with, there's no such thing as a finished building. This building is not refurbished in any extent. It's not like it burnt down and they got insurance money and rebuilt it. These people are still working in just white painted offices with cracks in the walls and bare bricks and bare floorboards. But we persuaded them to spend the money properly on the new bits of building. So now they're maintaining the old buildings and the new buildings together. They don't have the whole building lifted up at the same level. The building is, has no facelift. It still is an old building. But our new pieces are where the money is spent. That sounds like a very purist position, but then you find as you're working that you have to engage in invisible mending in order to make, in order to make it clear that you are detaching yourself from the existing building. You have to drastically interfere and change the existing building to make it look like nobody touched it. We worked a lot with uh, pigments. Um, we bought actually all of the yellow ochre in Dublin in bags. And the day that these five plasters were plastering down from the top to the floor without a break, the air was thick with yellow dust. On the other side from where you were just looking, um, you can see the story of the, you can see the story of the Quakers in the site and how they first this pink brick, then they raised to the where the square head, headed windows are, then they raised the roof, and with the bricks that they raised the roof, they filled in the square headed windows, and the, and they had round headed windows. Then for the cinema use, we had to fill in the round headed windows, so we used the bricks from wh which which were from the demolished low buildings opposite to fill in the round headed windows. So that hopefully, if you were a brick, if you were interested in bricks, you, you, you could read the story of this building through that. The blue is um, cobalt, uh, which was a nerve-wracking process of rubbing the cobalt into the plaster. Because on the blue, this is a light and sound lobby to get you into the cinema. But with the blue, we wanted it to be uh, gl uh, shiny, polished, um, like Carla Scarpa. We kept saying to our plaster, Carla Scarpa just finishes it with a hot iron, you know. And of course, our plaster had never heard of a hot iron on the plaster. But um, he was fantastically confident. And this, it would look like this, saturated with blue, and he would put it on. And then you'd come in the next day, and it'd be white again, completely white. And then you'd have to go off and buy more blue cobalt. And uh, I was getting into a terrible state. And the Plaster is saying, it's fine, it's like getting a suntan, you know, you just have to keep doing it every day a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> the other space is the external space. If that's the, the glass roof space is in the middle. The other space is the external space, which is made by the film archive. And the film archive is a street building on the opposite side to the side which you enter by the glass walkway. And it has in it a library, it has film production offices, and it has a basement archive. We're using the same device in the new photography center that I'll show you in a second, which is to run the, the archive across through the basement and to make a plinth out of that so you're standing on the archive and then the building emerges from there. So what's shown in this drawing, say in this, uh, these are all the different buildings that are in there, are the new ones and the old ones. And in this abstraction, you see the relationship between the projector box and the archive, which is a street building. So when that gets built, um, the projector box has a glass sliver of roof light over it, directly over the main projector to the main cinema. So as you pass by this gateway at night, you see the flickering light through the roof light of the projector as he's, projection, as he's projecting <coughs> into cinema one, and you're aware that there's a project, that there's film going on. And in um, this little, in this little window here, which was a sort of smoking window for the projectionist. He opens that and leans out into this courtyard. 
This courtyard has the configuration by its geometry of a small cinema. And in the film festival in the summer months, they have outdoor film in this courtyard, and the projection is projects out that little concrete window. So just to go through it once at night, um, you enter from the street on the opposite side from the archive, which is, the, which is used to street, and you walk down uh, a glass walkway, which is laid out before you like a, like a strip of film, I suppose. And this walkway runs is in inch thick glass li lit from neon from underneath and with no other money spent on the space except to paint it white. Um, it's like a long mild steel ladder. And parallel to that and just inside here is the bar which also opens out in into the foyer space. And the yellow wall comes right through and introduces itself into the bar as um, on the same, in the same continuity of its expression externally. The yellow wall in, in this photograph is blue, but that's uh, because of neon adjusting the color in the film. Uh, and upstairs, in the upstairs, you're on the reverse side, which is in a kind of edge, uh, more like a, the back side of a shell. And you're looking through that shell out into the out into the space, as if you were on a ship looking into the sea. And the openings are lined in 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 wax steel. The cinema is installed simply for acoustic reasons uh, within a, the, the screen is within a wooden box which takes a lot of acoustics and with the ceiling so that if cinema goes out of practice and quaking comes back in they can just remove this crate from the room and they can go back to their meetings. If you went right through it at night out to the other side you would pass under the stone box of the projector room and out eventually, and by turning left through that side, out, out through here and down, back onto the adjoining street. We made one gesture in this, which was wishful. Uh, here, we made this, we made this line, and we made this line of lights out into a surface, out into a derelict site, which was being used as a surface car park, which uh, was actually a way a lot of people would park their car and come into the cinema. But we had the hope that that derelict car park could be reused someday for public space. And in 1989 or 1990, when this design was finalized, um, it was more persuasive to say to people that the surface car park would make a good way of entering the cinemas. But the plan was that this would be a public space. Our plan. Uh, just to finish the nighttime, experience of the building, when you come out into the library or uh, archive courtyard, you're looking back up at that projector box and eventually in through the fire escapes at the interior of the cinema. Or in the daytime. These are the materials. We're using very simple materials. Um, we have very restricted budgets and maybe we have very, maybe we'd use them anyway, but they're very cheap bricks and very uh, ordinary limestone. The, the, this side, the archive, is in a kind of warehouse street. It's the backstage of the, of the Olympia Theatre. It's some clothing warehouses. And so the sense of the building uh, draws from the language of the, of the surrounding street. It's anyway a, a, a warehouse for film. And we wanted, in the most direct, in the most direct sense, that the scale of the street, that this sense of a shop window and the relationship of the warehouse, clothing warehouse to the street, would be brought forward and brought through in the relationship of the, of the archive library to the street. And the repetitive windows of the warehouse would, would connect with those. But then when you looked up, that maybe it would lead you in and direct your eye towards the new public space. The steel man that we met through doing the seat in the lighthouse became very critical to us. And uh, despite the best uh, professional practice lecturers that you will attend who tell you that to avoid nominated subcontractors at all costs. Um, the only way to work is with nominated subcontractors because the main contractor is not a builder anymore. The main contractor is a manager and usually knows less about building, even less about building than I do. 
and, but you go down to a yard where someone is working with something and they can work with the material. So in this case we got to know um, the steel man and had a very enjoyable contact with him where we'd just try and solve a problem and he'd come up with a way and working with the finishing on the steel which goes through every, every part of it from the floor to the seating to the balustrading to the ticket offices. Um, well this last slide would, would, would just be to try to say to you something about the space that we're trying to make and the character of the space we're trying to make and the way we work to try to arrive at that. We worked, we, we're part of a group of architects, part of a generation of architects who were taught by a, a phantom group called the Flying Circus who came to Dublin in, when we were in college in the 70s, in the early 70s and uh, all of whom are very well known friends of yours here in London and out of that, out of that uh, London, we, when we came to London to look for work in 1976 we knew every brutalist building, we knew the plans of the back plans of every building that was built in England in the 50s. Uh, English architects didn't recognize us, it was like we kind of popped out of a bottle, you know, with complete with um, a kind of a background education and in, in, in English architectural culture from a very particular period. Um, maybe experiences like that keep, uh, have a formative effect on groups because what, what happened to us is that we were part of the group not who were taught by those people but who just missed being taught by those people. So when we were in third year we went to crits in fifth year and we were in first year we went to crits in third year and kind of saw them going on but, and wished we'd met them but they were always just going out the door. And uh, it gives you a lot to rely on your own resources maybe or to chase after something that you really think might be there if you just were lucky enough to find it. Out of that generation of people who were you know, students then, there's a core of people now in Dublin who um, formed a group in 1991 when, when Dublin was about to be announced as European City of Culture. We formed a group called Group 91 to try to build a street, to build a building which would be a demonstration or an exhibition building about City of Culture for Dublin. And we actually were given a site by Dublin Corporation which was in, a, in, a, in the Liberties District in the centre of Dublin here which was a housing site that they couldn't work with because their model for housing is two-storey cul-de-sac and they couldn't deal with the, the site here and they had just demolished a five-storey tenement block and they couldn't put the, up another five-storey building. They didn't have it within their uh, range. So they gave it to us if we would go ahead with this project and we felt that uh, it would be an interesting thing to build a built model of an idea of urban life and it, in 1991 it was a radical act, believe it or not, to propose that people could live in the centre of the city. Um, we divided the street into plots, remember it was intended not to be a normal proposal but an exhibition proposal so we divided it into plots and each architect uh, working within a basic set of rules came up with a different interpretation. And in the project that I worked on with Sheila O'Donnell, my partner, we felt it would be interesting to take all of the characteristics that you find in a, in a Georgian house or in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a terraced house and to redistribute them without regard for their historical hierarchy. That is to say that it is interesting in a house to have small rooms for studies, large rooms for living, but it isn't interesting to have to feel that there are servants living in the basement and nannies in the attic. So we looked at a different way of organising the space I suppose relying heavily on uh, Adolf Loos for our inspiration that we could have one space in the house which is the staircase which would be five storeys high. We would have a uh, height and a half, 12 foot high living rooms and then we would have in between rooms which would, which, which would be for sleeping in. And so hopefully within every apartment you get at least three heights of ceiling and three uh, types of space and that is just delineated in this diagram plan as as being, the, as being in a nine metre plot the subdivision to give you these three categories and then to take that distribution of space and to start to work with it in the elevation to make a composition which is uh, part of your idea of reading this hierarchy of the building but in a, new, in a new way which talks about contemporary life. That project like a lot of well-intentioned projects uh, 
fell to pieces when the interest rates changed and the developers who had been very keen to back us found that it was better to keep their money in money than it was to put their money in building. But being resistant and uh, dogged people, you find that it, isn't, you, it, it doesn't go away just because it's gone away. So it comes up in later competition entries. This time we rather stupidly tried to make our entry into a continuous terrace, which uh, I'd be the first to admit was completely the opposite of why we designed it in the first place. But you get frustrated and lonely in Dublin. And um, <laughs> the, the other was the sense that living upstairs in these apartments, you would have this sense of, 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 uh, of, of uh, prospect, o prospect o over the city. Um, all of this is by way of preparation for the building that I'm working on now. The, in 1991, that group, which was Group 91, um, went through the whole business of assembling a group, of getting a project, of getting the site, of getting going, and then to find that it wasn't going ahead, and then to hear that there was a development project for, the inner, for an inner area of Dublin, which ran from Westmoreland Street all the way down the Quays to um, all the way down to the civic offices, which is about here. So all of this block here, what I'm trying to draw with this red line, all of that became available for an urban development scheme. And uh, we knew that not, not, not one of us at that stage in 1991 would have the um, <coughs> position to be able to persuade the city fathers to include us on a shortlist for a competition that they were going to hold. And so we felt that maybe if we took our group and came to them and said, we aren't just a bunch of small disorganized offices, we're a kind of a consortium of small disorganized offices, <laughs> and, and, we, and we should be able to, to make a proposal for this part of the city. And I think they let us participate in the competition by way, by way of gesture a way of saying this competition is open to all who are interested in the city. And then we had the good fortune to, to, to win it. So like the gamekeeper turned, like the poacher turned gamekeeper, we, within a three month period, we, we now have responsibility for this entire district. The history of the district is, uh, I don't mean it's long history, this is not such a long story as you think. The, hi the recent history of the district is that Temple Bar, as it's called, was for sale for demolition. And the, the demolition plan was to build a new bus station. So Skidmore, Owings and Merrill, you recognize their style, had made a proposal to make a bus station both sides of the river, <laughs> which meant you had to drive buses underwater to go right across, <laughs> and also demolished most of the city block in the interim. They got their, they got their permission or their license to make this proposal because a new Central Bank building had just been built, which demolished its little bit of the city, which you see here. The building starts just where the city stops, um, in a fantastic feat of, of uh, suspended structure, where the top floor is the first floor that goes on. For those of you who read Noddy when you were children, you remember that, that he wanted to build a house with the roof on first to keep him dry while he could build the walls, but you never believed it was possible. And this was what was done. And this building can't be demolished, of course, because of its, because of its tensioning system. Were you to try to blow this building up, you would demolish mo most of the city around it. So it's there's like a pent-up piece of, of uh, a anger. Um, <laughs> it's also the central bank. And it's, it's the plan for this was to uh, more or less do away with everything between here and the river. And my first photograph that I showed you, the little one with the glass roof, is on that site there. So we were part of a group of people who were protesting about this project. We were actually deeply connected with it because this site, for those of you who have graphical eyes to turn them upside down, were recognized as the site of the Irish Film Center. Um, this, this site was right next door. And when we bought the site for the Irish Film Center with our client, this was the current proposal. And people were saying to us, nobody, nobody will ever go to the cinema here because nobody was walking down these streets. And I remember in one desperate attempt, some person tried to persuade us that at least the people waiting for the bus up, um, would go to the cinema. <laughs> now, we, were, we participated in and part organized a conference in Dublin called the Dublin Crisis Conference in 1990. And this was the current proposal, and we were part of the protesting group against it. This is why we thought we wouldn't get invited by the government, if you like. 
But the leader of the opposition came to that conference in a, I suppose, in a spreading himself around to get votes. He was in opposition, Charles Hahi. And he promised at that conference that if he were Taoiseach, over his dead body would the bus company demolish Temple Bar. Six months later, he was Taoiseach, and we went to see him and reminded him of this promise which had been taped. And uh, <laughs> he, 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 in an imaginative and courageous move, uh, handed over all of the bus company's 20-year acquisition plan, handed over to a, a new organization called Temple Bar Properties, whose brief was to develop that part of the city. And at the same time as he did it, he withdrew from the project completely and asked to know no more about it, which meant that when he was subsequently and very shortly voted out of office, the project didn't go with him. Uh, our, our proposal is is now a reality, or at least in part a reality, was to take all of that area of the city, all of this area here of the city, and make an urban uh, argument about, about its rejuvenation. And we did it in outline and slightly cartoon terms in the competition. But we put an emphasis on two things. One was the existing street pattern, which is completely and perfectly obvious, but we're full of buses at the time, and the planners had forgotten simply that there were streets there. And the planners were making proposals to make laneways and archways and inner courtyards and passageways because they felt the streets were hostile. So we just said, use the streets. And then the second thing we said was to make public space on what were derelict sites. So the derelict sites that you can see is that one there, as you, just as you come across the bridge. That was our first slide with the little glass roof building. Derelict site there. There's a derelict site there, which we knew about because it was at the back of the Irish Film Centre, and it was the car park for the Irish Film Centre. And there were some other derelict sites in between. And we made a series of interlinked urban proposals to make a new continuity through that area and to hopefully uh, recharge that. I can't go into all of the detail of that project, but I can tell you that the a clever thing about the competition was that the significant commission which would be given to the winner was not defined in advance because they didn't know what the answer would be. I suppose one option might have been to put a new Bolborg, uh, you know, a large building, clear some ground and leave the rest of it look after itself. But because we had taken a much more uh, continuous and uh, small-scaled approach, and because we were a group, we were able to argue that our commission should be to make the public spaces. But out of the competition, we should carry on to make the public spaces. And then by extension, because we were making the public spaces, we should make the buildings which line the public spaces. And one of those moments where you sort of just don't know what's going to happen Somebody says, well, that sounds OK, reasonable. We'll give them the job. So we then, sh in, an, in a lottery and in a kind of discussion within the group, Sheila O'Donnell and I were uh, expressing an interest in this part of the site. That's the film centre. That's the film centre there before we started to work on it. And we said, we're kind of interested in this car park. And we had made a, an urban proposal for a new pedestrian bridge and a new link to the north side of the city and a glass roofed space like the one you saw at the beginning of the talk, and an urban square which could work with film projection. And we thought it would be interesting to work that up without a brief. So our cartoon for the space at the time had been this drawing, just an idea about projection and, and, and theatre playing at lunch. In this drawing, people are attending lunchtime theatre at the same time as they're having evening time cinema. But we did some dry runs then. This is the doorway at the end of the Irish Film Centre that you saw from the other side. And we did some dry runs with the client where we showed film outdoors on summer evenings. And um, Dublin has a very strong sense of public and street life. If there's something going on in the street, people come from somewhere to go to it. And we had large gatherings of people who came to watch cinema in, in the evening. And so our client was persuaded that this would work as an idea to make a public space. And so began a gradual and painstaking operation of property acquisition to buy up all the properties in this site, which were all owned by the people who had owned it for hundreds of years. And out of the idea of projection came the brief for um, photography, a photography center, and a theater, and some workshops, and a restaurant. And we divided those between us in the group. And my colleagues, Paul Kyo and Rachel Chidlow, are working here on this site to make a theater rehearsal studios and a restaurant. And Shane O'Toole, another colleague, is working on this site over here to make a children's theatre which can play out into the square. And Sheila and I are working on buildings on both sides of the square for photography. We have a photography archive 
and a photography gallery, and on top of the archive is a school of professional photography. So because uh, of the background of the Irish Film Centre and the idea of bringing all these cultural uses together under one roof, we were able to develop the brief for the Photography Centre as being doing a similar task for photography. So in this building we have education, we have uh, the photograph as social document, we have the photographer as, as a practitioner and we have the art of contemporary photography in this section. The lower area is for the archive, the upper area is the big studio for the photographer's uh, education and on the other side is the little building for the gallery of photography. Um, the little building for the gallery of photography is stacked against the Irish Film Centre like a mantelpiece against the wall and is designed on the basic principle of having, uh, of having a large window like a, a brownie camera. And the big building of the archive and the college has the job of making the connection between street and square. And so it's an arch, it's a bridge building to, to, to allow that to happen. On the ground floor of the archive, you, you enter here through the arch into a long hall which is continuous with the space outside. This time there are glazing bars to stop people walking through the windows. Um, and an inner multi-purpose exhibition space and a reference room for consulting the archives of the there are, it is one, uh, underneath in the basement is a full archive of quarter of a million glass plate negatives, the most wonderful photography archive of all of the streets in all of the towns in Ireland. And um, that makes up the programme for the ground floor. There's a, there's a door here from the street that brings students up to the upper levels. On the ground floor of the gallery of photography on the opposite side of the square is a bookshop for about photography. On the first floor there's an upper level a uh, mezzanine gallery that overlooks the large spaces below. And there's a little projection box here, which is um, like a crane driver's cabin bolted onto the side of the building, with a film projector in it and, slides and slide projectors in it, so that we can project images across the square on summer nights onto the window, which becomes a screen of the gallery of photography. The gallery of photography then has independent, has uh, exhibition spaces inside, which involve moving walls out from walls, like like John Sohn hangs the pictures in, in his museum, in his house. And uh, so we have a little building, but it, it has moving parts. And it has shutters in it that start to close off the window like camera shutters to allow film projection to work. Um, the gallery, this is the gallery of photography when it has its window and its zinc sheet over. That zinc sheet has a shutter behind that allows you to close off that window from inside, just comes down like a guillotine and allows you to have uh, installations which don't need natural light. And then above that there's a large screen that falls that comes down to allow you to have um, projection into the square. Because of its role, because of the symbolic role of the window as the eye of the building and as the screen, you don't enter the building directly from the square, you enter it kind of slightly round the side by this glass staircase. So you slide into it and as you slide into it you lose contact with, with natural light and into the exhibition environment. On the upper floor of the gallery of photography, if you can manage to read that sketch, is the, is the sense of a large room which looks back out over the square, which is just set up to be purely for the exhibition of photographs. And on the upper floor of the, over the archive, is a social area, dark rooms and seminar and staff rooms for the Institute of Technology that teaches the, pho the photographers. So on the top floor, the photographers have a studio which is the length of the building in the same way as the exhibition space downstairs, but it's subdivided by walls which slide out into cabinets that hang out the outside of the building. And the top floor of the gallery is a roof terrace that allow people in the gallery to overlook the cultural life that goes on in the square. The square will, will have a program of uh, theatre, performance, cinema and projection, and it, it will have a manager. When we bought this piece of ground, we bought it from a man, a family, who had been acquiring it piece by piece, yard by yard, for 20-something years, because the bus station was going up directly opposite. And they had it in mind for a large shopping centre, a large multi-storey shopping centre. And it took a long time, with the threat of compulsory purchase in your inside pocket, to uh, persuade them to sell. And at half past one in the morning, on the day when we'd been negotiating all day, when we finally closed the deal, he said to us, well, now that you've bought it, what are you going to do with it? 
And we said, we're going to pave it in stone. And he just said, you must be fucking joking. <laughs> um, you, uh, <laughs> you've just paid a million pounds for a piece of ground, you're going to pave it in stone. And he says, car parking underneath. And we, we said, no, 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 this is public space. So I suppose the, the, uh, we were able to do this because of the regeneration of the entire area of Temple Barham by being able to say that this is for public space. And then by somebody believing you when you say it, that person you know, becomes very important. This is it on site. Those of you who don't know anything about building will say, gosh, doesn't that look very exciting? Those of you who do know anything about building will say, that is the most untidy site I've ever seen in my life, <laughs> which is what I feel. Um, if you experience the building in its reality, like I described, you never see it in its elevation. You just see it obliquely, and it's a bridge between you and the square. But if you think about it institutionally, it's, it, it is actually a national institution. It's the National Library Photography Collection, a very important um, piece of the cultural heritage of Ireland. And so it has, in a way, it has a monumental, um, a monumental and formalized expression. That happens to be hidden behind a little street building, and you go down a lane to get to it. And by the time it asserts itself on the street, it's gone back to being studios, a uh, different, a more informal character. And the building is in this sort of state just now, just the day before yesterday, after all the rains. Um, they're just raising the brickwork to the top. The pieces of stone, Cortland stone stitching, are to mark the line between the archive and the College of Technology. This one just shows that that's an outside space for a terrace. So the windows of the College of Technology are not windows because photographers, although they emphasize light, they want to take their photographs outdoors. They want to show their photographs in darkness away from daylight. They want to develop their photographs in dark rooms. And they want their studios to have no windows because if they want daylight, they go outside. So the whole brief for this building is about having no windows. There's a window for the tutor, another window for the tutor, and another window for the other tutor in these three studios. That's the windows for seminar rooms, and otherwise there are no windows. And uh, this took us a long time to wrestle with an urban building which would be so closed. And we were relying on an idea of it expressed as if it were open. And we built it in such a way that if photography goes out of style, that these things are structurally discontinuous, so they can be replaced by windows. <coughs> Uh, you know, from the concrete, which you can see there. That one is, uh, will eventually, it's just now being walled in a blockwork and will then be covered in zinc. That little platform is where the zinc box of the projection box will be bolted on. And this space out here will be a square. It's all going to open this summer, believe it or not. Um, those projects, so which took me so long to describe, I'm sorry, are only one half of what I wanted to show you. I have four buildings to show, and those two I've shown. But they have taken, those two buildings have taken us these almost last 10 years in thinking. And it is unusual, and I would say uh, either lucky or unusually turned in on itself that we're able to do the photography center directly attached to the back of the film center and to make the public space now, today, that we wished for five years ago, and to have the continuity of theme between film image and photography image. The, this project is a different kind of story. It's, it's, um, it's a selection, it was a selection process where we, whereby we as architects would be chosen to represent Irish architecture in an international exhibition, and where an Irish artist would be chosen to represent Irish painting. And the selection having been made, we would be introduced to each other. And then we would be told, would we make a pavilion for his paintings? Or would we do a collaboration, which turns into a pavilion for his paintings? So Brian McGuire is an artist of about my age in Ireland who has been painting themes of isolation, themes of imprisonment, themes of um, loneliness for uh, most of his life as an artist. And he has lately been painting in prison. So I just picked these two pictures to illustrate two of the ones from the collection that we were housing. Uh, this, this 
this uh, uh, gouache um, is about loneliness or isolation, but you're on your own at the breakfast table, you're on your own in the coffin, and even in physical passion of sexuality, you somehow are still isolated. So he, love was a theme, but, but also isolation or imprisonment. This is a prisoner, that, a long-term prisoner in Port Leash Prison. This is a photograph of him when he was free, um, who is now in a cell in Port Leash Prison. But through becoming an artist and through working with the painting, he, in his mind, has his cell door open to the sky behind. If Brian McGuire was an artist in the 16th century in another country, he would have been, I'm sure, an icon painter. And we have to make a place to house his pictures, and we also had to represent something of Ireland as an island, and we had a lot of other business to get on with. So we tried to make it like a studio, like a container, and then to tune that studio to each of the paintings, so that we put up the paintings around our own office, either the paintings or representations of them, um, and then we tried to work with our idea about what an artist's studio or what a house for isolation might be, and then we tried to fit the pictures into it. So if I can just bring you first through the principles. First it has a platform, timber floor, on a three meter grid, which is built in one move with timber columns coming out of it. Then into that, onto that platform you install discrete items, a cabin or a box, a staircase, a sense of connecting through the space, and a raised floor which is open to the ground below, um, which is some way connected to his prison painting. I into that world you introduce daylight where you need it for the paintings and exclude it where you don't. And hopefully you're trying to make the light come down through two floors. And you're also trying to make the pavilion into a world of its own, which you can easily walk around but not easily leave. It is an island. You can take a cliff walk out, back in, and do circuits. If you're in a different mood, you can just shoot s straight through it. And the world, of, the world that's in his paintings, the world of shadows, the world of, uh, of dauntness, and the world of um, space for the individual was a world that we tried to build in into the character of our pavilion. We actually wanted that the pavilion might provoke an emotional response. It was an engaged connection between the paintings and the architecture, not, not a neutral background. So it got built, um, it actually got built three times. It got built once in a, once in a shed while we worked it all out in, 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 on, an, on an industrial estate. It got built in the Netherlands for an exhibition, in the north of the Netherlands for an exhibition of European art and architecture. But we couldn't get funding to send it to the Netherlands. Nobody would give us the money. So then we devised a new funding strategy, which was that the New Museum of Modern Art was going to open in Dublin in the late, in 1991, 1992, I think. And we told our potential sponsors that if they sponsored us to go to the Netherlands with the pavilion, then we would bring the pavilion back and show it at the opening of the Museum of Modern Art. And it would then be the pavilion that had represented Ireland in an international exhibition. Nobody would have granted us to build it in Dublin. Nobody would have granted us to build it in the Netherlands. But a lot of people came on board to be the people who had sponsored the pavilion that had gone away and come back. <laughs> and when that bit of business was done, we then had to persuade the Museum of Modern Art that we could show this thing in, the, in their courtyard after all. Um, it, it, it caused, I have to say, it was one of the most painful, it was one of the most joyous and painful experiences of my life. You, which I'll come to in a minute, I guess. Um, you, you were meant to enter it from this side, through the door, like you'd expect, through the facade. There was a big door for wandering in on the, here, there's a big door for wandering in and appreciating the space of the studio, and there was a small door for a straight shot, straight cut through and out the other side. And this was to, to, do with the ex, to do with the exhibition and the layout of the exhibition, and Ireland was meant to be the gateway to the exhibition in the Netherlands. People were meant to come in through the Irish Pavilion and see out along the, the plan of Europe and all the European pavilions, northern <coughs> European pavilions. At the time of the opening of the exhibition, it was at the time of the change in politics in the Eastern Europe. And at the last minute, they changed the entry to the exhibition to come in through Poland. And our front facade was jammed up against a wall somewhere in the Leibarden. 
but this was the experience you were meant to have of coming in like this. And then as you came in, you could leave or wander around. His more general subject paintings were hanging in the introductory studio space. You could take a walk out the door. Th th this painting here is a prison yard, walled prison yard, with the Dublin Mountains in the distance, with a football ground marked out on the, on the wall of the prison yard, and with the infinite sky above. And his idea that the space of the yard would be the container of your life, but your spirit could, could contact with the mountains. And we hung each one of these paintings in relation to a spatial experience, or a sequence of spatial experiences within the pavilion. At the, at the beginning of the collaboration, he told us that he had no, absolutely no interest in architecture. In fact, it was anathema, because the institutionalization that's represented by architecture was the opposite of his own interest. But actually, within every painting and within every piece of his work, like this one, there is a very heavy sense of the architecture. And in the end, we found ourselves, and still do now, talk about architecture quite a lot. As long as it isn't about buildings, it's OK. Um, that's Brian McGuire. It's, it's the only incident in the external elevation uh, with his eyes burning set in at eye level um, as an introduction on the side. There was meant to be a portrait of me on the other side that he was to paint, but we couldn't handle that. I couldn't handle that. Um, there's a little box here on the upper floor where you go into and you're just on your own under a virtual roof light to look at the paintings about sex, the, the paintings about isolation. And that room is just accessible to one individual. And as you come out through that room with the splayed reveals, you're facing the painting of the prisoner with the door open behind him. And maybe you make a visual connection between the floor that you're standing on and the floor in the painting. Or maybe in the underworld below that floor, on the sand in the floor below, you're looking up at people overhead. And these are, this is a painting called Liffey Suicides. This is the O'Connell Street Bridge, people looking over the bridge into the water, and the white bodies in the water. Brian McGuire found out that when somebody he knew was fished out of, of the Liffey, someone who um, was a suicide, that the fire brigade, when they were looking for a body, very often found, I mean, very often found another body or more in the water of people who had never been, lo never been missed. So the sense of, of loss, the sense of lost people was very important in his work. And this is a, another prisoner, portrait of a prisoner with the, in, with the sand floor. And you move through here from the opposite side and into the main studio space again. This was in substitute for a portrait of me, we agreed on a window, uh, which would be at eye level, on the opposite side from where his own face was, so that the architect on this elevation would at least be represented by, one, by a window. And if you look through that window, you see through this space and under the box and through to the pushed out plane on the other side and through to that window, which is directly in line with you, which is a window in a prison cell. And it's on the opposite side of that window that Brian McGuire's self-portrait hangs. And hanging in that prison cell is a painting that he drew from a story of, of, a, of a horrific occurrence in Mountjoy Jail where a prisoner had hanged himself with the assistance of his cellmate to quicken his, um, his agony, to release him from his agony. We felt we, this was the most difficult painting. This is an incredibly difficult painting. I mean, I, I'm sure you all have different reactions to this, but it is very difficult to deal with this picture. And we felt that we had to move it outside the structure, to light it from the side, maybe to express the sense of, if there's any sense of release, the sense of release through the window in a release through the wall. And that you, if you went to see this picture from that window there that you were looking at, would cross this bridge so that there was just you on the bridge looking at the painting, nobody beside you, nobody around you, and you, were, and you had the light through the, the cell windows here to light on the floor. The, the difficulty for us was um, deliberately trying to provoke an emotion, but not trying to make a mise-en-scene, and not trying, to, to, not trying to, to try to intensify the experience of viewing the painting, but not try to mimic the paintings to such an extent 
but they were not there anymore. This building lasted six weeks in the courtyard of the museum, and this is an unusual photograph compared to my earlier photographs because this is a photograph of its demolition. But the aesthetic and the interest that of building it in timber and the whole way of making it and the economy of making it became a real interest which, has, which motivated further work. And these last two shots of it are uh, a few nights before it was removed because they kept the museum open uh, evenings in the summertime. And it was full of it was full of these paintings, and it was it was like a Trojan horse in the courtyard of the museum. The the issue about the the building, the pain of the building, um, eventually turned out to be um, a double pain because artists and curators had one response to it, but at the grand opening of the Irish Museum of Modern Art in the refurbished building of the Royal Hospital Kilmainham with the 17th century uh, French-inspired building made open to the public that had a long time been closed, people were incredibly and deeply offended to walk into the courtyard of their heritage museum and find this shed in it. And uh, people who we knew for years spent a lot of time avoiding us at the opening. <laughs> and Sunday newspapers <coughs> conducted random interviews with people to ask them their opinion about it, and most people thought it, it, it was an eyesore. It was, a, it was an outhouse. It should, it should be taken down immediately. Funnily enough, in one of the in, inner rooms in here, there's a very beautiful, rusting uh, uh, Anthony Gormley sculpture hanging. Uh, it's called Still Falling. It's one of the castings around his body in space. And it's within the classical interior of the room in all of its brutality. But because it was a an object taken to the museum and put inside, people could accept anything in that context. <coughs> but the argument that the courtyard is the first room of the museum, and this is not a permanent building, this is an installation, it was too, too, too much for people to take. <coughs> now, following that project, and this is the last project I'm going to show you. Following that project, we were uh, on, you know, unlikely invitation. We found ourselves invited to participate in a competition for a golf club. Now, um, neither myself nor my partner have ever been near a golf club, and that is probably intentional. Um, we found out that hardly any of the other competitors in the competition had been to a golf club either. And it turns out that there was a very strong and quite dynamic interest in the part of the client uh, in a different kind of golf. It's in the north of Ireland, in, in west, in e um, east of Belfast, in Bangor, in an area where joining a golf club takes a long time, generations probably. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> the, the client's proposal was to make an open golf centre which would have no membership. And the idea that exercise is therapy and therapy is, is developing. And um, maybe you can have a place that is a club but not a club. And there were, uh, uh, the outcome of the competition was that uh, we were selected. And now the building is finished. The, this was our first sketch model, which is made in plasticine. And it was about the contour and about the landscape. It's in a beautiful uh, rolling parkland landscape despite this corny model, you have to believe me that it's beautiful, um, with, a f with a forest and some open rolling ground falling away. And there were it's a fix in the competition that this curved structure, not the structure, but the curve was a fix, because it's a, it's a driving range. That, for those of you who don't understand the code, a driving range is a place that people go to stand in bays, like stalls in horses in loose boxes, and they just whack off. Uh, golf balls in, into the middle distance, into either to there or to there, out of a bucket which they buy for two pounds fifty. It isn't as ridiculous as it sounds. There, there's a zen to it. We didn't understand it at all, and we thought it, we went to see several, and we thought it was the funniest thing we'd ever seen. And we put a walkway right along our driveway here, our driving range, so that all the sensible people could walk along the top and look down at these fellows who were doing this. Um, 
very shortly after we won the competition, the walkway was removed. Because um, if you are trying to do this activity, the worst thing that can happen to you is somebody walking up behind you and, um, and comparing you to the last guy they saw. But the geometry of it was an interesting aspect because of the curve. These are the 18th greens, and this way across the bridge leads to the first T. So in some conceptual sense, in the widest sense of landscape, the curve we interpreted to read as, as, the, as, the, begin, as the circle that you, that you go around as you play the golf. So when you start, you go off in this direction. And when you finish, you're drawn back in here to the, to the bar and so on. We wanted to build it in timber. We wanted to construct the landscape and to integrate the car parking and the clubhouse and the structure all together. The brief was the driving range over here, the car parking somewhere else, and a clubhouse, you know, like a proper clubhouse standing out there somewhere. And we decided to try to make them all work together in a different idea of landscape to building relationship. And so we made the model on top of a railway sleeper to try to represent an idea about the aesthetic of the construction of the place. And this, this early competition drawing um, shows the idea that the driving range could be in a cutting. We could make a courtyard which would be an embankment. And we could group the facilities of the golf club in a loose way ag against the continuous and relentless curve of the driving range. And then we could make a world between two levels, between the cutting of the driving range and the upper level of the courtyard and the world of the buildings. In the finished project, uh, there were several changes because our early scheme had relied on people moving outdoors. We, we had the changing room building, we had the bar building, we had a reception building, and some other buildings, and in each case you moved from the building out to the courtyard and into the next. This was because we thought that golfers were sporty types who spent four hours in the rain walking around grass. It's amazing, they are not. But when they change into their clothes, the last thing they want to do is go outside. They want to stay in the warm and go for a drink. And so the bracing character of our project was watered down by the realities of the golfers. And uh, they introduced, or we introduced, uh, uh, a centralizing space which I have to admit, because I'm among friends, was not our first aspiration. But nonetheless, uh, while everyone's talking about that, we got on and did the building. And the big idea, which was to make the landscape and to integrate this sense of building a building, not just on the land, but as part of the land, and to make the profile of the rooms read like volume, but to make them rooted in the, in the very large scale of making the landscape survived the long process of committee meetings and golf lessons. The, the, when you go to an 18th century landscape, an 18th century house in the countryside in Ireland, if you're with an art history tour, you will be brought immediately to the front door and they'll point out to you the Michelangelo-esque tapering of the pilasters down to an ankle uh, near the door and the finesse of that. But if you're not interested at that level and you stand back, you realize that to build that house, where they built it, they cleared a forest, they diverted a stream, they built a bridge, they terraced the ground. And there is in the land the entire energy of the will for the whole project. And we wanted to make this thing first about making the ground, second about making the buildings, and then they can use it as a golf club. This drawing is a joined up drawing of um, the approach from the car park the, and the sense of the levels. You approach it through this door here and the car park is tiered up behind you with the forest on the right hand side and the open golf course on the left. And the materials in the drawings go from uh, uh, an untreated cedar to a, a pigmented plaster. And these, these models are uh, at, made from the working drawings of the form, where it peters out into the forest, and where in the right-hand side, where the curvilinear line of the driving range is the thing that keeps the continuity that allows you to express the individuality of the other buildings. The buildings are, are, are as they look, the, the, bar, the bar restaurant building has a, an, a, a peaked cap roof that looks out over the driving, over the 18th hole. 
the reception is a volume that, like an upside down boat that, that, that is for walking into. The changing room where people don't want to be seen but need water is like a colossal uh, bar water tank. And the uh, little house at the end is for ground staff and caretakers and also now for um, <coughs> getting golf um, equipment from. And the building kind of fizzles out towards the forest. So that idea of the landscape, if you can in your mind's eye join that line to that line, um, is starting with the sense of release to the outer world and the sense of passage through and across the bridge into the woodland. Um, at the opposite end from going into the woodland, this is where you are finally welcomed back from the uh, par three course or from the competition course. This is like the head of a hoover that brings you back, back in and up onto the bars where you, um, the 19th hole. <laughs> it's built in, in steel for the frame elements and in block work for the masonry elements. And uh, under the steel frame canopy and against the block work walls are the timber elements built in. And the, the pigmentation of the render will weather and the cedar will go gray and the sand of the courtyard will, will stay like that and the, and the pewter colored metal will, will just get duller and duller. So when you view it from a distance, and the driving range is part of the landscape that ends in, in the beech tree which is kept and then the sense of prospect or the sense of openness that from the bar <coughs> to, to the 18th green. <coughs> Viewed from the other end, from the car park, the intention of terracing the car park was so, so when you were on the ninth, ninth green, tenth tee, middle of the course, that, that you could see back to the clubhouse uh, but the car parking is terraced in, in, in below you as you would have seen in the first concept model. And so as you wander around the course there's this uh, large kind of alligator of a building with its tail in the forest and its jaws out to the west. As you approach it on the gravel walk from the car park you move in through this uh, entry area which is gated at night with a huge steel um, a huge steel gate that, that wor works on a, on a wheel and a track I into this entry, uh, entry lobby. The, these shutters close over the windows and uh, you, you move forward from the entry side into the reception. And this is the reception hall and it has these little pop-out boxes that, that relate you to the courtyard beyond. There it has a south facing roof light that brings the sun into the reception and then you step up onto these little spaces for coffee and you open the shutters and you're in contact with the courtyard beyond. The sense of sequence from the, this is the car park out here which is just now being laid out and, the, and the, these will all be planted with uh, hedgerow plants and rowan trees and um, uh, uh, hedgerow, hedgerow growth. And as you come out then down the gravel path from each car park in, into the woodblock floor of the entry hall and, and then out onto the courtyard which is measured out with, with railway sleepers. Then you dive down a further level to go to down eventually to the driving range. And all these little boxes are where the people are having their coffee inside. And if you go off in this direction, you go towards the woodland um, and across the, bit tr uh, with the prospect out over the driving range and in into the woods. Um. The driving range uh, is, is made in steel and, it, and it's this un underworld and we managed to keep for, for the, we managed to keep a sense of some contact are overlooking. This is now slatted in timber as you would have seen in earlier photographs. And so if you were up in the courtyard you do have a sense of contact both with the activity of the driving range but more importantly maybe with the extensity of the landscape out beyond. 
th these are construction shops. And in the detail, it was about the bringing together of that cedar with the with the uh, with the pigmented render, and uh, hopefully uh, refined rusticity um, will develop through the weathering of the building. They do move all these shutters and close it at night. Um, this last photograph of it is is related to the earlier pictures you saw of the model, but. Um, it's about the connection from the woodland out onto this raised world of the embankment and the embankment forming an address for these different characters of the buildings but then the whole thing being situated within the wider landscape. Our latest project and the project that I go back to work on when I leave the AA tomorrow is in the west of Ireland in Connemara <coughs> and it's for a furniture college and we're trying to use some of the ideas that we were working on about landscape in this project to make a new landscape for the Furniture College. This is an existing institutional building which was a prison, a reform school for um, urban, urban truant children, an industrial school for boys in the 19th century. And it's now being used as a furniture college, quite a good furniture school. And they're expanding into uh, furniture and timber research and development. And so we're adding sawmills and research workshops and timber development, multi-purpose rooms, yards and fields and museum buildings for Irish historical uh, museum furniture. And we hope through working with the ground and through working with the character of the building that the things we've learned through the film centre and the things we've experimented on in the golf club will be put to another test in the, m in the making of the furniture college. It looks like turning into, because it's one of those fundraising projects, it looks like turning into another of these long stories um, about building in Ireland. But So maybe it will be three, four years in the making before it's finished. But that tends to be how we have worked and um, it's what gives us our sense of motivation or our sense of uh, purpose, that we are working as architects in society. We're not working just in a room. We're working, we have a role in relation to society. And it's possible to discuss that role and to describe that role and to have clients or uh, funders of buildings and users of buildings to participate in the meaning of the work. Um, this is not we sometimes are uh, advised by people that Temple Bar, the devel urban development plan, is an architect-led development. Well, it, it is and it isn't. It's architecture-led, but it's not led by architects because otherwise it would just be about buildings and it's about life, actually, in, in the city. And uh, I just believe that to, to make the buildings to have the meaning over a long time of their life they have to come about out of more than simply the architect's sense. Um, I didn't really mean to say all that. I just meant to finish off by showing you the end of the golf club and the beginning of our Connemara project. Um, that's the end of the lecture. Thanks very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the, the, the structure came about because of the structure came about because of our interest in making a balloon frame studio that could come 
that could be erected in three different places and, brought and taken apart and put together. We also have an interest, I would say, in, in roofs and boats and parts of buildings that, are temp that fall in and are temporary and leaving the, r the permanent foundations of buildings behind. So we thought if it's temporary, it should be like something that, that could blow away or be taken away. Now, it started off with us talking to Brian McGuire about, uh, because he wouldn't discuss the architecture and because of the difficulty of his art, we found some common ground in talking about Beckett and about Beckett's writings. And we worked on a text from Beckett called The Lost Ones, which is about people living, uh, the Beckett's, it's a short story of Beckett's and it's about people living in the bottom of a huge abyss and they're all just crawling around like in the bottom of a, an enormous tank. And uh, they move during the day up ladders and into recesses in the walls and down those ladders and across other ladders. And so we began to construct between ourselves and the painter an imaginative world about people and ladders and movement. So before we designed it, we knew there would be ladders or that sense of climbing within the building. So we, we had the idea of it being temporary and we had the idea of it being uh, uh, vertical or vertiginous. Um, he then, at the last minute and late in the day, said it had to be a gallery and it had to be white. So it's funny, after the beginning when he wanted us to interact so intensely with the quality of his paintings, when push came to shove, he just wanted to hang a picture on the wall and have it on a white wall like he would have it in any gallery in the world. And, and all of our ideas about the integration of his work with the work were reduced to pictures hanging on the wall. So I myself feel that there is a world in the difference between the exterior of that building and the interior. I don't think it's in the construction, but I think it's in the resolution of the compromise of giving him a conventional, well-lit gallery environment. We wanted shadows. He wanted shadows in his work, but he didn't want shadows on his work. If I wanted a shadow in the painting, I would have painted it, is what he said. And so we wanted to bring light down through our gridded floor. He loved the floor, he loved everything. He thought it was great, but when he put his picture on it, he did not want one single shadow, not, not, nothing, not anything, just the painting. And so we had to introduce a way of lighting his paintings in compensation for the daylight. So his paintings are artificially lit so that, so that they're perfect with no shadow on them, but there are shadows falling all over them in the end. Um, or maybe I'm not answering your question. The, the, to, to the, the, the relationship between the skinning, uh, the, the corrugated iron when it goes on, tensions up the structure. It's waving like this. You put the iron on sheet material, it tensions it. Every barn in Ireland, every ordinary farm building, the rawest and the most remote structure you can get is still made, is industrialized at its cheapest level, is made in a frame structure and with a corrugated iron sheet painted red oxide. And we wanted in some way, some sense that the building was lonely or alone or, or lost. And okay, it's in the courtyard of a museum, but, but it was meant not, it was psychologically it was not meant to be in that <coughs> world. Oh, the film center is blue. Um, <laughs> no, I think the natural pigment. I mean, we have, we, we have blue cobalt in the film center. We have ye ochre, yellow ochre in the film center. And we have glass and stone. Uh, in the photography center, we have white, white Portland stone and red chalky brick. And in the golf course, we have uh, oxblood pigment. And in the tin shed, we have uh, red oxide, ordinary red oxide paint. There are more colors than red, blue, and yellow, <laughs> and gray, and glass, but uh, we like them to, we like to relate something to them, where they come from or what they feel like. And they will come in bags and you open them up, and you know, it's amazing. No mixing. Yeah. 
Well, the limits of language, uh, I, I accept it. I mean, it's a golf club today and uh, an uh, art pavilion yesterday and it could be a furniture school tomorrow. Um, I don't know. Uh, we're just, it's like adding one word, you know, every few years. Uh, we're not interested in turning into a different character for every project, but we are very interested in establishing the character of every project. But we're the same people. Um, I accept it. I mean, it's a limitation. <laughs> it's, but it's also, uh, in our terms, we're just architects always doing the same project. You know, you just sit at your board and do the same project. And if you lose it in one competition, well, it'll come up somewhere else. You don't mean it, you know, but it does. I don't think we're alone in that. There's a lot of architects we could have asked that question. Of. I remember Sterling said to me, I worked with Sterling in, in for five years. Sterling said once that uh, he was worried because he went to America and somebody told him that uh, he'd only had, they'd analyzed it, you know, a degree student in America had analyzed all of his work to date and he had only had five ideas in his life. <laughs> and. Uh, Sterling said, well, he was initially very worried about that. And then he realized it was three more than Mies. <laughs> and, and, and five more than Gropius. <laughs> and, uh, so uh, we're, we're looking, you know, we're still, we're just working.